All right, let's open our Bibles tonight, Deuteronomy chapter 9, as we continue our journey through our favorite book in the Bible, the book of... Oh, you guys are not nearly as excited as Leviticus. What happened to you? Well, the book of Deuteronomy is a great book because it is a final bunch of sermons that Moses gives to the nation sitting on the borders of the promised land where 40 years earlier the people had come, that first generation, and had turned back. After all that they had seen and all that they knew, they, they really just determined together God wasn't worth trusting. And so though they had seen much and been given much, they turned away. And as a result, the Lord vowed to them that they would die that generation in the wilderness. Two and a half million folks were with them at the time. Well, now they've come back to Kadesh Barnea, back to the land, back to the promised land before them. And Moses' last job before the Lord takes them home at 120 years old is to encourage them not to do what their parents did. (laughs) Have more trust in God. Learn from the lessons of the past. And we've been asking the Lord to just speak to us regarding how does this apply to our walks today and our generation as we serve him. Moses did a lot of reminding them about the past because that's where the lessons certainly lie, asking them to remember how it had been, what they had seen God do, and even the past year, and we've mentioned it a few times, this past year, this run-up to this land, they had been able to defeat every enemy of any note or consequence on the eastern side of the Jordan. They had taken out big kings and kingdoms at God's, with God's help, and just by his word, they were ragtag, they didn't have an army, they weren't trained, but they had the Lord. And in obedience, these nations fell, and now, you know, they are ready to move forward, and these are the final words. So remembering was vital both to their present as well as to their future. Certainly, your life as a Christian is the most exciting thing that you can have as a believer. I, I, I don't know if there'd be a better way to live than being a, a believer. But if you're going to discover how good it can be, you're going to have to surrender your life. And that's sometimes the more difficult thing. We've been saved. God has washed us. Our sins are as far away as the east is from the west. Your name has been written in the book. You're headed for heaven. Your destination is clear. The only thing that's left is how you take the journey there. You know, what are you going to do each day? There are going to be bumps and bruises and potholes along the way. But you can ride over a lot of them just by trusting God. And that certainly is this picture that we find here. It is, it is a life lived by God's grace and willingness to look to him that will set us off on this wonderful adventure. So here is the second generation. And Moses, with every chapter, picks a, well, not with every chapter, with every theme, I should say. He picks a different you know, thing to go after. And tonight, there is really just one theme in chapters 9 and 10, and that he wants the people to realize that they're faithless, but God's been faithful. And that if they're going to go forward and expect to have victory, that they're going to have to do so recognizing the fact that they haven't earned or deserve what God has given them, but he is more than willing to give it to them. And he will take one example out of the other, and he's got plenty to choose from over these last 40 years to drive home that they were saved by God, delivered, if you will, from Egypt, so that they might serve him. That's the lesson. God has, has called us. We're not all that good at doing what he wants, but he's awful good at doing what he says. And we can hang on to that promise far more than hanging on somehow to our, you know, looking for credits or, or resumes upon which we can stand. So that's really the lesson for tonight, save to serve him. Verse 1, chapter 9. Moses says this, Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today and go in to dispossess nations greater and mightier than yourselves, cities that are great and fortified up to the heavens. A people that are great and tall, the descendants of the Anakims, whom you know and of whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the descendants of Anak? Therefore, understand today that the Lord your God is he who will go before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you, so you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord has said to you. Now, the first time that these families had arrived here and the spies, you remember, went out, they came back with a pretty horrendous tale. I mean, they said the land was good, and look at the fruit we brought back, and it's, it's a beautiful land, certainly it would be a place to live, but, and then all but two recalled more vividly the high walls and the taller tribes and the giants in the land and the, and the armies that they saw, and they, they basically convinced two and a half million people Whatever they saw was more powerful than the God that they knew. 
and the people bailed. They bailed on God's call. A lot of these had, folks were young. They had heard it from their parents. Some of them hadn't been born yet, and they were just hearing it through the grapevine. But now they're standing where their parents, where their grandparents stood. And the people hearing the reports concluded that God had brought them out here to die. In fact, they said to the Lord, our children are going to die here. You've brought us out to destroy us. And God responded to their unbelief 40 years earlier, <clears throat> to their forgetfulness of all that he had done in bringing them out of Egypt and getting them to that point. And he said, all right, you're not going to go in. I'm going to take you into the wilderness where you're going to wander around aimlessly until you die. And then I'm going to take your children, the very ones that you said you were worried about and that they were going to die, and I'm going to show you they're not going to die, they're going to live. And not only are they going to live, they're going to go forward and conquer the land that I have promised to you and you wouldn't take. They were looking at the enemy. They'd stopped looking at God. They forgot exactly how miraculous the provision had been to get them there. And so their children are standing now and sitting in front of Moses. And, and, and he doesn't want them to, to bail. <laughs> he wants to refocus their attention on the fact that God is faithful. Please don't mock, or I should not say mock, balk as your parents had balked when they got here. Now, and I want you to know something about faith and God's calling. Moses doesn't, if you will, minimize the task. He doesn't say, oh, they're giants, but they're slow. Or they're giants, but we can surround them. He, he says there's giants. <laughs> there's going to be a battle here. This is not going to be easy. He doesn't hide the fact that the enemy was greater in number, was greater in size, were led by the giants. This was some serious, formidable foes. And yet, he said to them, but God's going in front of you. They're big, he's bigger. They're bad, he's badder. I don't know if that's good, but he's badder. That's a good thing. He's badder, isn't he? And Moses wants to be sure that, that their faith in the Lord was realistic that they should see they're in a battle, but God is capable. In, in Luke 14, when Jesus speaks to the disciples, <clears throat> he talks about counting the cost before venturing out in faith and says it's really foolish if you, if you don't count the cost and you get halfway done and then you fail at it and you become this terrible witness. So, you know, it, it begins in prayer here, but, but we need to move forward. The, the road can be pretty rough. It's not so easy being a Christian, and it's getting harder by the day to live in America and, and speak for the Lord. It isn't gotten easier. But if you see the opposition and you understand the cost of, of the steps of faith, then realistically you can assess that you can't do it. God can, and if God doesn't, it won't get done, and you're left to just rely upon him. That's Moses' hope, certainly, for the people. And he wanted them to be aware of what lie ahead, but also to see who would lead them in the air. You, you know, the nations are mightier than you. And the walls of the city, and he, he almost uses hyperbole, they all the way stretch to the heavens. Well, if you're fighting an army and they've got 20-foot walls, it might as well be to the heavens, right? It's about as big as I can imagine. Can you imagine? So there are lots of giants, but, but I love the words in verse 3, therefore you should understand today. If you're going into the land today, verse 1, you should understand today that they are not mightier than the God who will go before you like a consuming fire. The battle belongs to the Lord. He, he'll do as he said, Amen. It's important that we learn that. And I love the idea that, that you get this picture often of God being like the trailblazer. You know, he goes ahead of you into uncharted territory, and you're terrified. You don't even want to look what's ahead, but he sees it, and he takes it on. And I think that, you know, by application, you're walking in the Spirit in a very wicked world today. I don't know if there's ever been this much of an upheaval in an election year than there is this year. How upset people are, how frustrated they are, how wondering what comes next. And, and you're in the minority. You're, you're a, a believer in Jesus. You're often maligned. You're going to be increasingly, I think, persecuted. You, you look hopelessly outnumbered. You're nothing but, you know, politically incorrect in all of your ways. And, and then I say to myself, looking out, well, God has them right where he wants them. And he has us right where he wants us. The victory is ours. The weapons are not carnal. They're powerful to the pulling down of strongholds. You know, Luther's, one of his favorite sayings used to be, you and God equal a majority. And that's what God wanted this nation to know. They're a majority because the Lord was going with them. 
So know that today. Know that. You should understand that before you go, that he is bigger and stronger and mightier, though, verse 2, the people you face are bigger and stronger and mightier than you. Do not think, verse 4, and, and this really is the lesson that is driven home through the rest of the two chapters. Do not think in your heart after the Lord your God has cast them out before you and say to yourself, because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. But it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out from before you. It's not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you go in to possess the land, but because of the wickedness of the nations that the Lord your God is driving them out from before you, and that he may fulfill the word which the Lord spoke to your fathers, to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. When he gives you victory, never let the thought enter your mind that you are somehow being blessed because you deserve it more than they. That's a pretty heavy thought. You haven't earned it. You're not better than them. In fact, you're far from lovable, blessable, or deservable. Oftentimes, you're not even very usable. But I'm not giving you the land because you earned it. I'm, I'm taking you into the land because they need to get out. Their judgment has come. You have grace written all over your face. You're marked by God's grace. And the wickedness of the Canaanites was bringing the judgment of God. But the victory that you're going to have comes by grace, not by works. Their time has run out. Yours, not so much yet. You still get a time to live and serve and, and, and walk with God. When we are in need, I think we easily see our weaknesses. When we're in trouble, when we are worried, when there is anxiety, our shortcomings become very clear. But when rest and victory are ours, man, it's hard to see. It's so difficult to see that, that if we forget who our strength is and, and, and who gets the credit for our blessings, then we're going to be in big-time trouble. You remember Peter and John standing in, in the Solomon's porch when that man that was lame had been healed as Peter and, and John had clung to him, and he'd been laying there for years. In fact, if you go back and read Acts 3, he was laying there when Jesus was coming to the temple, and Jesus left him there. <laughs> he didn't heal him. And Peter and John had been coming by for a while. And, but this one day, the Lord spoke to Peter, and, and I don't have any silver or gold, but... But I'll give you what I got in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he did. And the people went, whoo, touch me, Peter. <laughs> touch me, John. And Peter said in chapter 3, verse 11 to them, look, don't look at amazement or marvel at us as though by our power or somehow by our godliness this man has been able to walk. This isn't our doing. This is God's doing. It's a good thing to say of, of yourself when God uses you. This isn't my doing. This is his doing. That's not false humility. That's just smart. Because that's where we're at. We're depending upon him. He alone is good. And we're just blessed to belong to him. And Moses reminds them of God among them as a consuming fire. But he urges them to stay humble in victory and give God the glory for everything. Because one of the big issues for all of us is pride. And oftentimes we're blinded to it when we think we're so special. But we're not. Right? And that's, that's, his, that's his lesson. If you want to know the lesson of chapter 9 and 10, it's right there in those Two verses. Notice in verse 6 the words, therefore you should understand. Remember what he said in verse 3? The people are bigger than you, but God's going to go with you as a consuming fire. You should understand that. Therefore understand. Again, he says the same thing here. Therefore understand that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you're a stiff-necked people. <clears throat> and remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day that you part departed from the land of Egypt... Even until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Come on, Moses, relax. Breathe deep. Pretty mean-spirited guy, is he or not? He literally says to the people, look, you didn't get here by any goodness of your own. In fact, I would put my, my, your history before you and, and point out one after the other how from the day that you and the Lord met, you, you've found a hundred ways to not be deserving at all. You failed him at every stop. And he says, therefore, understand, verse 7, and you should remember, because how quickly we can turn from seeking his grace to demanding his blessing. From standing on his grace to demanding a reward for our goodness. Even comparing ourselves with other people. Oh, I'm more faithful than the guy in row five. Don't count five rows now. You don't know which way I'm looking. <laughs> or I'm more faithful than that guy in the back of that fell up on the day. I should be the one. Don't wear rose-colored glasses. You provoke the Lord. You've done this since the day that you met him. 
You don't deserve to be here. You're standing on your grace. You didn't really outdo your parents much. Don't think you're the, you're the favored generation now because you're here and they're not. Understand and remember. And then what follows is a whole bunch of illustrations of where things went wrong. <clears throat> so by the time that Moses is done, he wants to, at least after chapter 10, to have the people walk away from, it, from his Bible study night by saying, oh man, we're so glad God's grace is with us. And we realize how things might have gone had, there, had we run out of grace. Verse 8, he says this, In Oreb you provoked the Lord to wrath. The Lord was angry enough with you to have destroyed you when I went up into the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant, which the Lord made with you. I stayed on the mountain for 40 days and nights. I didn't eat or bread or drink water. And the Lord delivered to me the two tablets of stone that were written with the finger of God. And on them were all of the words which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of that fire in the day of the assembly. And it came to pass at the end of 40 days and nights that the Lord gave me those two tablets of stone. They were the tablets of the covenant. But he said to me, Arise and go quickly down, here for, down from here, for your people whom you have brought out of Egypt have acted corruptly. They've quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made themselves a molded image. <clears throat> Six weeks out of Egypt, they arrived at Oreb. Oreb is Mount Sinai. It's the same place. You can mark it down until you remember it. But at Mount Sinai, or in Oreb, they would camp for nearly a year as God made himself known to his people. It was a reuniting of the people who had been in bondage for 430 years. His love, his power, his mercy, his demands, their sinfulness, the sacrifice, the priesthood, the law of God. He wanted to give them everything so that they might know him. So they sat there for a long time to learn his word and, and to learn his love. But during that time, early on, Moses was called up to meet with God because the people had seen God's presence with all of the earthquakes and the, the fire and the thunder. And they said, you go talk to him. We'll do whatever he wants. And Moses was called up to meet with the Lord and to receive the law from his hand. And, and you know from Exodus chapter 32 that while he was with God, the people were in the valley. And, and in a matter of less than six weeks which, by the way, was the amount of time it took them to get out of Egypt to this place, they were already looking for a way to go back there. They wanted to go back to seeking a god, an idol that they could worship. They had lost track of Moses and felt like they'd been left on their own. They wanted to, to go back to the bondage. They forgot everything that, that God did in those ten plagues and then the manna from heaven and the water from the rock. They forgot it all in a matter of six weeks. Even Moses' own family member, Aaron, <clears throat> betrays the Lord and, and takes his position to help the people in their rebellion. He doesn't forbid them. He aids them. He helps them. God was angry. Notice what he says in verse 12. Your people that you brought out of Egypt. He doesn't even want anything to do with them now. <clears throat> Furthermore, the Lord, verse 13, spoke to me and said, I've seen this people. Indeed, they are a stiff-necked people. Le leave me alone or let me alone that I might destroy them and blot their name out from under heaven and I will make of you a nation mightier and greater than they. Pretty sharp and, and fearful words. They deserved judgment. That's his point. And they'd forgotten already of his power and of his glory. Sin had overwhelmed them and God's words to Moses were words about what they deserved. Here's what they deserved. Yet by his grace, not their goodness, <laughs> they were going to survive this. And that's Moses' point. You could have just stopped dead in your tracks there. But you met God's goodness. It was God's goodness, not your goodness, that kept you. This was one of those low points in the, in the life of the of the, of the nation that would be repeated constantly. And, and it's the, mo the reason Moses shares it here. I, I think everybody just hung their head. Yeah, we remember that. Your people whom you've brought out of Egypt, these people are yours, Moses. God didn't want to claim them. They were breaking the commandments of God that they had been given verbally by the Lord before they ever got a chance to be put into print. Before Moses could bring them down on stone, they were already violating. The Lord had said these Ten Commandments to them verbally. They said, all right, that's good. Moses said, I'll go get the first edition. I'll be right back. And he'd gone up to receive them from the Lord. But even before they were written down, these guys were already breaking them down. 
even before the written version showed up. And the Lord's point is, you're hardly a, a, a holy or a righteous people. In fact, he says of them, you guys are a bunch of stiff-necked people. You deserve judgment. And notice the Lord said, I wanted to destroy them, take their name out of heaven, and I'll start with you, Moses, and we'll make a, a more faithful group. Well, Moses returned, verse 15, so I turned and I came down from the mountains, and the mountains were burning with fire, and the two tablets of the covenant were in my two hands. And I looked, and behold, you had sinned against the Lord your God. You'd made for yourself a molded calf. You had turned aside so quickly from the way which the Lord had commanded you. And so I took those two tablets, and I threw them out of my two hands, and I broke them before your eyes. Moses came back from what had to be the greatest 40 days of his life, hanging out with the Lord, to see the most horrible thing he had envisioned, the people back to their old ways. Six weeks out of Egypt, he'd been gone six weeks, and they were back at it again. And he throws down the first and only edition of the law written by God's own handwriting. I don't know if he was angry or if this was symbolic. Right? He breaks the tablets of the law. They had broken the terms of the covenant. Maybe both of them apply, but the bottom line was, you don't deserve to be here. Early on, out the gate, you should have been wasted and wiped out. But God is gracious. How quickly you turn and forget. This incident is repeated time and again in the scriptures to speak about the need for God's grace and the wickedness of man's heart. Well, in verse 18, Moses says, And I fell down before the Lord as at the first, so he went back up. For 40 days and for 40 nights I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all of your sin which you've committed in doing so wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. I was afraid of the anger and of the hot displeasure with which the Lord was angry with you to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me at that time also. And the Lord was very angry with Aaron and would have destroyed him. And so I prayed for Aaron also at that same time. Moses had been told by the Lord back in verse 14, let's just start over. But Moses was an intercessor, wasn't he? For Moses, I think it was a test. What are you going to do, Moses? God already knew what he was going to do. You know, Jesus would later be tempted by Satan to bow down to him and so that the kingdoms of the world would be his. Satan tempts to disobey. God tests to strengthen our obedience. They both have different purposes, for sure. And so Moses does what, what Moses is called to do. He intercedes for the people. He prays for Aaron. He cries out, please, God, have mercy and spare us what we rightfully deserve. Moses is a type of Christ who would stand between the wrath of God and the sinfulness of man to become our Savior. God loves us, but we deserve judgment. Moses' only argument in this whole thing is, that's why wherever God takes you, be sure you realize you don't belong there. He's, he's brought you by his grace. And, and keep humble. And, and notice the miraculous way Moses interceded. It's the only place in the Bible we find a man going for 80 days without food or water. That's impossible. You will die. <laughs> you will die. But Moses lived. Why? Because what the flesh can't do, the sustenance of God can do. And God's intercession for us is miraculous. Only God can save us, right? We can't do it. Moses would have died interceding had God not kept him alive. Jesus came to die so that we could be kept alive. Well, Aaron had been left in charge. Verse 20, and, and he had not let, led the people in the ways of the Lord. He hadn't calmed their fears when Moses had seemingly disappeared into the clouds and maybe he was never coming back. But I want you to notice, it's an important verse that even people in leadership, inner circle guys like Aaron, can stumble and fall. It's always horrible when you hear of big church pastors taking nosedives. There's unfortunately been way too many. And if you read Aaron's excuses to Moses, they're ridiculous. They're the kind of excuses you make when you're caught red-handed and you don't know what to say. He started saying things like, well... The people, they wanted it, and, and then a miracle took place, and out of the gold that we threw into the fire, bounced out a calf. We just knew it was God. Shut up, idiot, is what you want. You're so a liar. You're such a liar. When you hear some, you know, if someone you looked up to take a nosedive, pray for them. Or someone that led you to the Lord goes back into the world. You've got to pray. We're all pretty weak and faulty, right? 
God help us. And, and Aaron's no exception. But we are told in verse 21 that Moses, when he says, I took your sin, the calf, which you'd made, I burned it in the fire, I crushed it and ground it into very small until it was as fine as dust, and I threw its dust into the brook that descended from the mountain. A couple of things, crushing idols because they're metal and wood and they're impotent and they have no power. There's something else, too, in Exodus 32. It says, when he ground it into powder, he scattered it on the water, and then he made the children of Israel to drink it. It doesn't mention it here, but he said, here, drink this down. I'm sure that got in your stomach. It swole you up, made you feel terrible, made you sick. Hopefully, it made their stomachs as sick as that made the Lord in seeing it. It was a pretty you know, visceral kind of lesson. So Moses says, you don't belong here. You're here by God's grace, verse 5, 6, and 7. Here's one example. Remember how you began at Orb? But hey, that wasn't the end of it, verse 22. Also, at Tabra, at Massa, at Kibroth Hatava, you who provoked the Lord to wrath. And likewise, when the Lord sent you from Kadesh Barnea. Tabra is the word for burning. Numbers chapter 11, remember that when the people began to just complain against God, there was one day he just had enough of it. And all of the murmurs began to die. And it started on the outskirts of the camp, the people furthest away from where God's presence was. And they began to fall over dead. And at some point, the people went, all right, we're sorry, Moses pray. They went to a place called Masa or Meribah. The word Masa means to be tempted. The word Meribah means to strive. They, they are references in, in Exodus 17, Numbers chapter 20. It was where the people accused God of letting them die of thirst. It was in this very place only a year earlier that Moses had gotten so angry with their demands for water that he took a, uh, that rod that God had given him and the Lord had said to Moses, just speak to the rock. You've already hit it. The type is Jesus gets struck. He dies. He gives us life. You can now ask. Um, but Moses was mad. Do I always have to strike this rock? And he, he went to beating on the rock and it was that lack of representing God properly that caused Moses to now be told or to then be told he would not be allowed to go into the land. That was at Meribah in Numbers chapter 20. The Kibrath Hatava is a place, in other words, that word means graves of lust. But you remember in Numbers 11 that the people were so mad at, you know, we're always eating this manna, we could use some hamburgers or some T-bone, you know, give us some meat. And the Lord caused this miraculous wind to blow and the quail began to just kind of fall into the camp and hover over the ground. They could just knock them out of the air and these guys had more meat than they could ever have wanted and, and they began to chew on it and as they began to chew, they began to choke and kill them. In fact, David in the Psalms write, he gave them what they wanted and with it brought leanness to their soul. Again, it was that, that unfaithfulness to God who had fed them so well, taken care of them. It's striving, it's complaining, it's murmuring. And it's crying out for things God doesn't want, and it had led to the graves of lust. You, you haven't had a good track record. That's his point. You came out not doing well. You made the trip over not doing so well. Verse 23 is the words, um, likewise, or in the same manner, when you finally got here to Kadesh Barnea, to the promised land portal, if you will, and God said, you should go up and possess the land which I've given you. You rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. You didn't believe him. You didn't obey his voice. You've been a rebellious people against the, the, the Lord from the day that I knew you. Look, the last time you guys showed up here, you neither believed or obeyed God. You rebelled. From the first, from the coming out to the about going in, nothing has ever changed. You've always been the same. Remember that truth about yourself. That's what he's saying to them. God's grace, not your righteousness. Your history is not very good. I suspect that if, if we could put all of our histories up on the screen, none of us would want to watch it. Am I right? I'd like to see some of yours, by the way, up here on the screen. You're a, a, you're a perfect example of the grace of God, aren't you? Aren't we all? So, verse 25, Moses falls on his face before the Lord. Then I prostrated myself before the Lord. He goes back to this first example. For 40 days and 40 nights, I kept prostrating myself because the Lord had said he would destroy you. And I prayed to the Lord. I said, oh, Lord God, do not destroy your people and your inheritance, whom you have redeemed through your greatness, whom you have brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember, 
your servants, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and do not look on the stubbornness of this people or on their wickedness or on their sin, lest the land from which you brought us should say, because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land which he promised them, because he hated them, he has brought them out to kill them in the wilderness. Yet they are your people. They are your inheritance. You've brought them out by your mighty power and by your outstretched arm. Moses wants to be sure God knew he had nothing to do with it. I think it's almost like Moses said to the people, why do you think I spent half of my life on my face before God? Asking that he doesn't deal with you after your wickedness, but by his grace. You know, Moses, when he had first been called by the Lord, was filled with excuses. Do you remember? I can't speak so good. I really don't know what I'm doing. He had a lot of excuses. Now, different guy. Pastor's heart. What kind of witness of God would it be to the Egyptians, the other nations, if your people just simply died out here and they concluded... You killed them there. You couldn't deliver them. God, if for no other reason for your glory, keep these people. After all, they're your problem. You brought them out. You made them. You took care of them. You, 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 you. Chapter 10, Moses continues reviewing their past so that they might have a proper outlook as they go forward. And he keeps reminding them and reminding them, and well, you get the message. You know, I like the fact that, that a lot of the pastors in the Bible never seem to get tired of telling the same stories. I thought about Paul writing to the Philippians and saying in chapter 3, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious. For you it's safe. There's something about a good story with a good lesson that bears repeating. And I know that, that I often pray for our church services that, you know, for some of you who've been around for a long time, I, I don't know if you're going to hear a lot of new things, but you're going to hear a lot of old things that need to be learned well. And, and the only way that we can learn them is if we'll stay teachable and keep listening because, you know, at some point, your life becomes traversing over familiar ground. There's much to learn. Always something new. God will pull back the layers. But, you know, be teachable. Stay open to learn. God wants to speak. You'll know the story. You know the Christmas story well. There's, there's lessons in there, though. I, I always pray that I could convince our average church-going believer of the great benefits in, in going to church during the week and systematically going through the scriptures. You, it's hard to convince folks. I, I, here's my argument for you. You know, we have th three services on Sunday morning and one service on Wednesday night. Why is that? Or on Sunday night, one service, not three. Because you can't convince folks well enough that it's important. It just is a hard sell, if you will. Not to me. I'm sold. And I suspect not to you. You're here. But that's what we have to pray for, that more than just simply being familiar with the Bible, we might be the kind of people who dig in and search for God's truth like buried treasure and hang on to it as such, the treasure that we found. There, there's a great benefit in, 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 in putting that in place, certainly for our lives. And, and Moses has a way, of, like when you read this book, of just continuing to, to hammer home principles that have to be learned. And, and you've you got to hear it more than once. My father used to say, I've told you a thousand times. I don't think he was exaggerating. I do believe he told me a thousand times. And I, I believe I ignored him a thousand times. It's kind of like that spiritually. It's a battle, man. You hear it, and, and yet you're dreaming of other places and long days, and your head's not in the game, and you go home, and you're, what did I do the last 90 minutes? I haven't learned anything, and nothing hit home. It's important that we, we come wanting to learn. So you pray for the church, not just ours, but every church, that the Bible studies might be overflowing. That's what you want. You want people out the door not able to get in because they're hungry to hear what God has to say. Verse 1, chapter 10, Moses continues, At that time, the Lord said to me, Hew for yourself two tablets of stones like the first one. Thanks for breaking the first edition. Come up to me on the mountain, make yourself an ark of wood, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. You're going to put them in the ark. So I made an ark of acacia wood. I hewed two tablets of stone like the first. I went back up into the mountains, having the two tablets in my hand, and he wrote on the tablets, according to the first writing, the Ten Commandments, which the Lord had spoken to you in the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of your assembly. And the Lord gave them to me, and I turned... I came down from the mountain, and I put the tablets in the ark which I had made, and there they are, just as the Lord commanded me. Where is the ark today? Lots of speculation. If Jeremiah hid it, as many scholars believe, 
to keep it out of the hands of the Babylonians as they besieged Jerusalem in 606 and in 586. He did a pretty good job because 2,500 years later, nobody knows where they're at. I'd sure like to see them, wouldn't you? How exciting would it be to look at a tablet and go, God wrote this. Not that he didn't write this, but he wrote this with his finger. No teletype. This is God's, and he wrote in cursive, you know. We're not teaching that anymore in school, but I have no idea. And the pot of manna that was in there too, and, and that rod of Aaron that budded that got assigned to this ark of wood, would be the greatest archaeological discovery ever, wouldn't it? And it would probably be turned into an object of worship in like 20 minutes. So I'm glad that God's hidden it good. In fact, after the Babylonians overthrew and raided the temple, there is nothing further told us in the Bible about this tablet or about you know, anything that was in the ark at all. We do, however, have this interesting verse in Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, and this was what it says. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen. <laughs> no idea. Maybe it's in heaven, and we're going to get to see it one day. It was certainly a type of those things in heaven. Maybe it's actually there now as show and tell for us when we get there. Verse 6, Moses quickly summarizing. So I turned and I came down from the mountain, put the tablets in the ark which I've made, and there they are, just as the Lord commanded me. Now, the children of Israel, they journeyed from the wells of Benjakan to Morserah, where Aaron died and where he was buried, and Eliezer, his son, ministered as a priest in his stead. And from there, they, ju they journeyed from that place and from that place to that place. I'm not going to try. A land of river of waters. And at that time, the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord to minister to him, and to bless in his name to this day. Therefore, Levi has no portion or inheritance with his brethren. The Lord is his inheritance, just as the Lord your God promised him. So, quick summary. Moses moves their travels forward. He stops after moving from Oreb. He speaks about the priests and the Levites being separated. And all that we have read if we, when we came through the Exodus... He now shares. Verse 10, he goes back to where he began. As at the first time, I stayed in the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. The Lord also heard me at that time, and the Lord chose not to destroy you. And the Lord said to me, Arise, begin your journey before the people, that they may go in and possess the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. So Moses goes back to where he started their rebellion with the idol and ended his point by saying, God heard the cries of mercy. God didn't destroy you. Instead, he sent you forward. And here you are, a product of God's goodness. So Moses teaches them about intercession, about prayer, and about deciding to fulfill God's promises in his people. The lesson is important. We deserve judgment. You believe that? We're going to get grace. So be humble and remember and then Moses rushes right in, beginning in verse 12, to the present tense, right? To where he's speaking to these folks now. He says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today, for your good. So what a great question. What does God want from you? <laughs> I like that. What have you given him? Remember some of the things we've just noted. What's God looking for you to, for, from you tonight? Go to verse 12 and 30 and make a list. He, he wants your fear, reverence, your awe. Right? It was, it was Job who said, Behold the fear of the Lord. That's wisdom. To depart from evil, that's understanding. It's important that we continue to live uh, in a way that says, I don't want to sin because I have a great dread of his judgment and I don't want to displease them. I know I have grace, but man, I don't, want to, I don't want to live that life like I used to live. I want to live in a way that is awesome to the Lord. A lion has roared, Amos will write, who shall not fear? Hey, look, if God decides enough is enough, who's going to stand? Acts chapter 9, there's a great verse that says, throughout the churches they had peace and they walked in the fear of the Lord. So that was his first call. You who are going in, walk in the fear of the Lord of the Lord. Walk in his fear. If you reverence him, if you realize who he is and what he's done and you know his great love, your heart will be broken. He wants you, notice in verse 12, to walk in all of his ways. Know what he wants 
And may what he wants be as important to you as it is to him. May you be able to say, Lord, I want to please you and mean it. And then seek to do that by his strength. He wants you to love him. It says there right in verse 12, to love him. We know from the Bible that on the heels of reverence and obedience, to love God is not an emotional call, but it is a call to obedience. The way you express your love for God is obedience. Not feeling, not words. Oh, I love you. I got goosebumpy he's talking about. No, he just wants you to do what he says. If you love me, keep my commandments. Right? That's the way we show love. Not in words, but in behavior. He wants us to serve the Lord with all of our heart and with all of our soul. Or if you want, God wants you to give it your all. Wholehearted. Not once in a while. Not inconsistently. Not sporadically. Not periodically. Not come sometimes. Not others. Give it your all, man. Your will and your emotion be engaged in obediently loving the God who so loves you. And be aware that you're you're standing on grace. And, verse 12, he desires that you keep the commandments of the Lord, which he has, verse 13, given, oh, sorry, sorry, verse 13, which he has given you for your own good. I like that. My father used to say, what I'm doing for now hurts me more than it hurts you. I'm doing this for your own good. I didn't buy any of it. I didn't believe it. But when God says, I believe it. If God says, thou shalt not, trust me, thou shalt not. Because if thou shalt, you're going to be in trouble. Thou shalt not far wiser. If God says thou shalt, then shalt. I'm going to teach the whole thing in the old King James right now. For your good. They had failed to do so, but we're still standing here on the borders of God's blessing because God loved them. His grace was with them. And not only that, he was about to go in front of them as a consuming fire. They'd only begun to walk in the grace of God. There was much more of his grace Waiting. We have to be diligent, and even if we are diligent, we'll still fail in what he wants, yet then we can stand by his grace. You know, as a child of God, the problem for me is not that I don't want to do what God wants, or even that I disagree with what he says. It's just that I'm stubborn, like Israel is. And I want sometimes to do things myself. <laughs> but to the extent I can learn that I can't, he can. And... and my failure doesn't mean I'm, I'm, I'm off the team because if God reckoned on the team by lack of failure, we're all off the team, right? He didn't reckon that way. He loves me. He sent Jesus to the rescue. We're sinners, but we live by grace. And, and what I can't do, he can do. It, it's the same lesson, right? As you read in chapter 9, verses 4, and in verse 5, don't think when God begins to bless you that it's because of your goodness, I have two paths to heaven that I can attempt to follow. The first is to just be perfect. Yeah, that won't work. And if I fail at that, then I can go to Jesus and be saved, and he'll help me fear the Lord and obey the Lord and love the Lord and serve the Lord. You know, the first commandments were set in stone, and they were broken. The second set was placed in the ark, which represents Christ, and those could be kept by him. The first ones, they tried on their own, and you broke them. But the second ones were set in the ark, which represents Jesus, who will preserve us. So here's Israel. They're entering the land. It's a picture of you and I living in the spirit, right? It's not heaven. There's enemies here, tall guys, Anakims, walled cities to the heavens. But it is, it is an enemy that is stronger than us, and yet God fights for us. It is an enemy that we can't defeat, and yet we can't lose in Christ. That's the picture. And you don't deserve it, but grace blesses. We're to walk in the Spirit, possess the land, overcome the enemy, stand in his grace, do so humbly. Pretty good picture of how the church should go forward. Verse 14, Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. And the Lord has delighted in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all people as it is this day. So circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. God, who is Lord over all and without equal, has chosen you out of all of his creation to love and give privilege to. That's amazing, isn't it? You should just go, man, I can't believe it. You're his chosen people, so quit being stiff-necked. Surrender. The, the practice of circumcision that's mentioned here, which was unique to Israel, never given to you or to me or to the church or to the Gentiles, you know, it was designed to be a spiritual lesson. Cut away the flesh, 
be a spiritual people ruled by God. That's, that's what the entire lesson was. So give your heart over to the life and the spirit. Be a spiritual people. Quit being so, so stiff-necked. Look, you serve a God who's done everything for you. Moses is pouring it on, isn't he? Verse 17, the Lord your God is, a, is the God of gods. He's the Lord of lords. He's the great God. He's the mighty and awesome one who shows no partiality. And he doesn't take any bribes. In other words, he's hard to compare earthly-wise. He administers justice for the fatherless and for the widow. He loves the stranger. He gives them food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger. You were strangers in the land of Egypt. Fear the Lord your God. Serve him, and to him you shall hold fast and take oaths in his name. He's your praise. He's your God. He has done for you great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. And your fathers went down to Egypt just as 70 persons. And now look, the Lord your God has made you as the stars of heaven for a multitude. Moses ends his, his encouragement to realize who they are and who God is by bragging about God. He's the only true God, his heart, his love, his blessings. Verse 20, fear the Lord again. You want a proper worldview? The big word, catch word today, worldview. You should have a good worldview. Here's your worldview. I'll, I'll make it simple. Don't even have to read a book. Ready? Fear the Lord. That's your worldview. Fear the Lord. They'd gone out of 70. They'd now grown to, to millions. And God was with them and had great plans for them. Indeed, verse 21, he's your praise. He's your God. He's the one who's done great and awesome things. Isn't that us tonight? Seriously. That's us. Father, thank you tonight as we sit together how faithful you have been, that you have saved us to serve you, that we are called to walk in this world as your people, to shine as lights in dark places, to testify of your love, to share your word, to preach the good news to every creature, to, to, to bring them in, to bring them to Jesus, to tell them of the cross, to, to baptize them as they believe. And Lord, you, you've sent us in that we might Tell them about who you are. May we be, Lord, the, the, the people of God that live spirit-filled lives in this generation. May we not be overcome by the world or, or, or caught up, tempted to, to bow down to idols as they have. We don't deserve, Lord, what we have, you, but you've given to us by your grace. We're so grateful to belong to you. You're the great God, and we need to to know you better and to love you more and to, to fear the Lord and be faithful in the commandments and to rely upon your spirit, to, to, to not just talk a good game, but to live it so that others might hear of you. May, may we learn from Moses' pep talk to the children of Israel before they went in that there's something to be said for seeing ourselves clearly as, as beggars and in, 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 in paupers in, in the sense of we, we can earn our way into your grace, but yet we are blessed. Our names are written in the book of life. You have called us to yourself. And though we deserve far worse, <laughs> you've chosen to give us life. You're the righteous one. You're the holy one. You're the good God who loves his people who aren't so good, but who today hang on by faith to your grace. And I know that you have a work for us to do that is far more than we could imagine. And certainly, you are more capable than, than the fear that so often grips our hearts when we look out to the world and wonder how we can make a difference. But if we'll walk with you, if we'll trust you, God, you've got great things in store. Your eyes are always going to and fro through the whole earth to show yourself strong. On behalf of those whose hearts have been turned towards you, may that be you tonight. Know your place. Know the grace. And then take your position in fearing the Lord. Go out and serve him. Hungry for his word. Knowing him well. Teachable. Usable. Saved to serve. We'll have some of the pastors up front after the service. We'd love to pray with you. Maybe your commitment has been faltering. Or, or maybe you don't know Jesus at all. And you need to come talk to them tonight. And Just to be sure that you and the Lord are on the same page. That you understand what his idea of salvation is. And how it can only be found in his dear son. But may God put these words from Moses' mouth to the people of Israel sitting on the borders of promise. And may he put them to work in your life as you sit tonight in a church service ready to go out into the world.
and shine for Jesus and bear much fruit. Shall we stand?